Today's video is going to be about balloon madness, namely hot air balloon madness. But before we get there, we're going to start with a portrait as part of telling the story. Now here at the Royal Society, where I'm joined by head librarian Keith Moore, there are lots of amazing, impressive portraits. So you're probably thinking, what amazing portrait are we going to show you today? Is it going to rival these amazing ones we see here of Humphrey Davy and Charles Darwin? Prepare to be disappointed, people. Not the most impressive no. one you have in the collection, is it? Well, no, but on the other hand, Tiberius Cavallo could make his own portrait. This is a self-portrait? Yep, so he was a silhouette artist as well as a scientist. I remember when I was a bit younger I had a silhouette done where they cast my shadow up on mm -hmm. Tom Wall and turned it into a piece of art. Yep. It was the first time I realised just how big my nose was. A noble profile, surely. No, uh, no I'm sorry. Yes. yes. It was the first time I realised how noble my nose was. Cavallo did lots of other things besides. He's a leading electrical scientist and because he began to get interested in chemical reactions to do with gases, he was interested in balloons. From what you tell me, Keith, at this time in the late 1700s, the 1780s, hot air balloons were all the rage and our man was no exception. Yep, balloons were really taking off. Disappointing cut. So what have we got here? Well, I think we should have a look at Cavallo's book on this phenomenon, the history and practice of aerostation. Why is it called aerostation? Why well, they didn't have a word for it, so they were making up their own. Okay, so that means hot air ballooning, basically. Let's have a look at the contents here, so we get an idea of what's in the book. General principles of aerostation of inflammable air. Inflammable air is obviously hydrogen. Yep, they're using hydrogen in balloons as well as hot air balloons. On the shape, capacity, construction and power of aerostatic machines. Machines. Mm -hmm. Aerostatic machines, nice. It's like your ultimate guide to hot air ballooning. We could spend a lot of time in here, but in true Brady style. Are there any pictures? Uh, not very good ones at the end. That's no, not true. No. That's not true, these are good pictures. Have a look at these people. This looks to be a little bit about maybe how they're making the inflammable air, how they're Yeah, it looks like they're producing gas and filling bottles and bladders here. Yeah. yeah, so that's probably producing hydrogen with chemical reactions. But I like this one, look at this. It's a great picture. I don't know what that little diagrams, how that fits into it all. That seems all quite sort of simple compared to all this nice etchings of barrels and things. Mm -hmm. but, but the balloons are a bit boring there, really. I think we, we need a far more decorative balloon than that. Let's move on, because balloon madness is gripping the nation at this point. So this is a letter to Sir Joseph Banks enclosing a design for a potential balloon. So it hasn't been made yet, but they want Banks' backing to actually go ahead and make this thing. So Joseph Banks at the time, of course, is the president of the Royal Society. Mm, so yeah. this is a big so deal. So if you want a bit of scientific patronage, he's your go-to guy. It sounds like this person thought, oh, I'm just going to design one and send it to Joseph Banks yeah. and maybe they'll make it. So here we get to look at the plans. They're a bit faint, but I'm sure James will help us later on here in post-production. Yeah, so these are by Henry Smeathman. Now, Henry Smeathman is famous for being an expert on termites. I always like to fly in hot air balloons that have been made by termite experts. Yeah. It looks like the top half of an Easter egg and it's got some kind of big gondola underneath. Yep. And it's got wings coming out the side. Really big wings, yep. Here's front on. Mm -hmm. We see there's some people. It's like it's got a face as it looks at you. And we see decorations on well, the balloon. You can see here's a lion, here's a unicorn. So this is a very British coat of arms, of course. Oh, yeah, the lion and unicorn, nice. Oh, this one's a bit more on an angle, so we can see both wings. Mm -hmm. The lion is a bit more obvious here. And there's a building here for scale as well. Mm -hmm. Was this top down, do you think? Or? Yep, so that's the, the plan view of the machine. Cumberland, who writes the letter, then decides that the wings are a bit too much, really. Who would think of flying with wings? What an absurd idea. So he redesigns it there, and you get this little draft drawing in as a secondary proposal. Oh, OK. So Cumberland, who's like the intermediary, has decided to put his own oar in the water here and yeah. say, yeah. this is how how I think you should design. Yeah. But we've got something else. So here we have a book by Thomas Barlow, which gives you an idea for the first time, really, of what it is to see a view from a balloon. Aeropedia or aerial recreation. Look at this. A view from the balloon at its greatest elevation. So they're above the clouds, as you can see. They look like little nuclear bombs going off, but obviously this is just the, the top of the clouds looking it's, down. It's just very stylized. They're trying to capture what they can see on the ground, the clouds around and below them, and even the colour of the sky up to the horizon. 
I'm assuming you have been above the clouds in planes and things at various times. Every now and again. Yeah. What do you yeah. think about this? Is this a good effort, do you think? It's not bad, but there's a better one. How about that? That's a bit more realistic, isn't it? Mm-hmm. So if you take that little centre point in that first picture with the river through it, it's almost you're kind of homing in on that sort of a view. There seems to be a, perhaps a town there. Yeah. What are these lines here? These black lines over the top of it? I think this is the course of the balloon. So you, you're seeing in this kind of loopy effect here, the way the balloon has travelled. Ah, right. Very cool. Oh, here we go. And this is telling us where this is happening as exactly. well. Exactly. So this is the kind of overlay, if you like. So it started in Chester, by the looks of it, mm -hmm. and they went all around the place. They went near Warrington, and they finally landed here at, what's that, Rixton Moss? Mm -hmm. Lancashire. Ah, you know that place, do you? I don't, but it says it there. So. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> One last picture here. The balloon over Hellsby Hill in mm -hmm. Cheshire. Yeah, and you can just see the balloon. The balloon's right at the top here, just a little tiny speck, giving you an idea how high these things were going, looking down on what's quite an impressive hill. Mm, yeah, it is. There we go. Balloon madness. This is rather nice, I think, because you, you're seeing the world as it was being seen by the balloonists, these early aeronauts. Uh, and that's pretty special, I think. Indeed. Have you ever been in a hot air balloon? Do you know I haven't? I should do that. You yeah. haven't? No, no, plenty of aeroplanes, but no balloons yet. If there are any hot air balloonists out there that want to take Keith for a ride, we'll come along and film it as well. Yeah, I like engines and my things. Do you? Yeah. I know a few hot air balloonists. I can probably sort you out. Yeah, OK. He took a very famous balloon flight, which took him up to the stratosphere. It was the highest balloon flight of its day. He promptly, as he was observing his instruments, lost consciousness. And happily, the pilot of the balloon managed to save the day by climbing up into the shrouds, releasing the gas from the balloon and promptly falling into the basket uh, overcome. But they gradually sank back to a, a healthy height. They certainly went over 37,000 feet probably higher than that. Nobody really knows how high they went, but it was a, a record for, for a good long time.